Oh, hey gang. Isn't this fantastic? I'm finally going to get it done. I mean, when I started this thing, there was no way I could have imagined it would take seven full weeks to get a piece of pit guard material. We'll have a talk about that in a bit. Anyway, can you see what's going on here? I'm cleaning and shining up the back a bit. So there's before, ew, after. Ah. Oh. The finish on this is really thin. Um, it's an open poured finish, meaning they didn't use a leveling compound in the pores of the wood and try and flatten that surface out before spraying on what well, looks to be just a couple of coats of lacquer. Because, I mean, there's not much on there at all. If you look at this in oblique light, you can see and feel all the little spots and canyons of the grain. So it's got a texture to it. Now, in the last couple of weeks I've had a couple of people send me photos and videos they found online of restoration projects where people took really old guitars, as old as this or older, fixed them up and then refinished them, trying to bring them to a super high gloss. And I have to say, if it's your guitar, I don't really care. You can do whatever you want to it. But to someone who appreciates what they're looking at, spraying lacquer and trying to buff it up to a mirror almost never looks good on these. The wood moves around over time and it picks up warpage. Like, the back here would have been flat at the factory, but now, if I run my hand over it, I can feel the position of all the braces on the inside. So if you go ahead, you spray on seven coats, try to treat it like you would the finish on a brand new guitar, rub it out, buff it and everything, all those little imperfections get thrown into high relief when the light bounces off of it. So it's almost like you see them first. They call attention to themselves rather than your object, which was to sort of eliminate them. Um, you see the defects rather than the shiny surface around them. And it's incongruous. It doesn't go together. Your brain has to figure it out. It's like, is that a really badly made new guitar? Or is it an old guitar that was refinished to look new, but they did it in a bad way? What's going on? So usually less is more when it comes to this stuff. Clean it. Don't try to make it look brand new. So these open poured finishes tend to pick up dust and debris and like atmospheric oils will fall on the surface over time and they kind of get stuck in the pores. And the whole thing starts to get oxidized as well. So it gets kind of hazy looking. And I'm just cleaning it a bit and rubbing some shine back into the surface, but I'm not going to take it too far. As I said, to do the cleaning, I like uh, lighter fluid. I prefer the Ronsonol brand because it's the one that Jimmy used to burn his guitar at Monterey. Um, you can also use naphtha that you can buy from a paint store. I use a lighter fluid because it has this nice little applicator and squirts out just the right amount. And I'm just going to clean the surface. Naphtha does not harm um, guitar finishes. You can use it on lacquer, shellac, polyurethanes, even oils. And it's not going to, you know, do damage to the surface. Now you see I'm rubbing in circles using this slightly abrasive um, paper towel here. Like if this was a a high gloss surface, I might not do that. I would probably stick to one direction. But my goal is to clean the surface. And it's already got enough scratches and stuff going on it that I'm not too worried about it. So that's going to pick up some dirt from the top surface. Now the other thing I will do on this one, which is admittedly, I don't know, this might not be something I should teach everyone, but what I'm using is some um, shellac. This is de-waxed shellac. It's actually orange shellac in a one pound cut, which is a fairly light duty cut, proportionally more thinner than there is shellac in there. And I'm just going to lightly French polish the surface. So that shellac dries very fast. And I can take the same rag and I can feel it go through the stages from tacky to dry. And I'm actually burnishing the shellac. I'm almost picking it off the top of the surface and some of it's gone down into the pores and it has taken the stuff that was in those pores, um, which formerly was kind of opaque, and it suspends it in a little layer of shellac. And it doesn't look like white specks anymore, so it kind of brings back the color. Now, you have to be careful when you're doing this. I have experience French polishing. You know, I don't, that's why I don't really want to recommend it for everyone. And I'm not leaving a big thick layer of shellac on the surface. This is like dry. But what it's done is it's brought back the color. And it's made it a little more shiny. And this is something I would only do on an open poured finish like this. 
if this had filled pores, I'd more likely use an auto body rubbing compound. Uh, this is a polish. This is a Mother's California wax system. Um, they come in different grits. You want something reasonably fine. If it was too aggressive and you were, you know, really rubbing for a long time, you could theoretically rub right through the finish, especially one that was as thin as this. The problem with using this stuff on a finish with open pores is that it acts like a pore filler. And when it dries, it dries kind of white because there are little compounds in it. Uh, the abrasive grit that does the actual polishing. So at the end of the day, you would end up with a guitar that had like white streaks in all of the pores. Um, doesn't look so great. And I've seen guitars that have that's been done to. You can also buy, you know, like your standard guitar polish. This is a Gibson polish. Can be used and it can have similar effects actually. I don't know if we can make that happen or not. Sometimes they dry clear. You won't notice it for about 10 minutes until it's all, like all these solvents have flashed off. But it can be a bit of a problem. So, like I say, the shellac treatment, I'm only doing it on this guitar because number one, it's mahogany. And number two, it's got an open pore finish that's got like this white hazy stuff going on. Ordinarily, I would probably just clean it and leave it as is. The back of the neck, I'm just going to rub to a sort of a medium gloss using micro mesh. On to the elusive pick guard. Now I actually happen to have an original 1960s Harmony guard here for reference. Uh, the celluloid on one of the corners up and died. But um, you know that will work for general pattern and shape and size, etc. Interesting color too. Like that's not tortoise at all. It's more just some groovy orange tones that they swirled up. But in other ways, this stuff is really difficult to replicate these days because you can't find plastic in this size. The suppliers just don't seem to provide it. Um, ran into this the other day. Uh, my friend Ed down at Birchway Sound had me replicate a Gibson guard from the 60s, and it was exactly the same thing. Like, it took forever to find something that was kind of the right color, but it was nowhere near the right thickness. We ended up with this stuff from Stuart McDonald, which is tortoloid. It's only half a millimeter, or, you know, 20 thousandths-ish. And you can imagine Ed's rage when, after he waited six or seven weeks to get this stuff, and paid almost $80 by the time you factor in shipping to find that it was made in Canada. So, ugh. okay, Tortoloid, whoever you are making this stuff here in our country, please get in contact with us, because we like you, and your product is it's good stuff. But we want to request something. Um, you got to start making it in one millimeter thickness, rather than half, because all of these 1960s guards, they're like 45 thousandths of an inch, or just over one millimeter. It would be so much nicer if we could get our hands on some. You can, of course, order pre-made pick guards from places like Stuart McDonald or Luthier's Mercantile. Um, this is quite a nice one. Um, it's cut for a full OM size with a rosette, so I don't think it would look good on this guitar. That's reasonable. Um, the garish yellow color, don't worry about that. That's actually reflected white from the backing. It's much more subdued. But, again, not the right size. Otherwise, I probably would have gone with that. If you start ordering stuff from China, it's the same situation. It's all half millimeter stuff. Various patterns. The issue with the Chinese, the darker tones, they look okay on spruce. It's actually quite a nice pattern. It's printed. It doesn't look like the real deal, but it's close enough. They actually have the... Uh, the white backing is part of the adhesive, and, you know, the actual printed surface here has that yellow included in it. So, you know, I don't think that looks that good at all on a mahogany guitar. It's just, you know, the yellow part's just not right. I mean, they make it in reds, too, which would be an okay choice, I guess. You can, of course, buy actual celluloid guard in thicker sizes, but they're too thick. Like, this is designed for... I think I use this for replicating uh, the pick guard on uh, a Les Paul Jr. Um, it had been shipped with a black guard. The owner wanted a tortoise guard. And again, this stuff is incredibly expensive, especially if you want to ship it across borders because it's a hazmat. So I think this thing cost me like $80 for this piece. But it, again, it's too thick. This is actually, I think, two millimeters over 80 thousandths. Yeah. So too big for this guard. Um, so what am I going to do? I think I found... I'm going to go with this one here. This is a dark color. 
tortoise. If I cut it from this part here, I don't think that's going to look too obtrusive. It should be nice. You know, the option is, is of course, just to go without a guard, but this guitar is already so plain without having like an extended rosette, just the interior one. And I think it needs something there. Yeah, so I'm going to make one. I'll cut one out. Now the radius cut into this pick guard is close, but it's not perfect. I think we can do better than that. So I'll take some measurements around the ring. Yeah, I want to call that 98 millimeters. So I'm going to set my little Olfa compass cutter here to about 49 millimeters. This is a wonderful tool, but it's also infuriating. There's enough play in it that it doesn't do exactly what you want it to do every time, but it works well enough that you can throw it out. I think that works pretty well. And there are a couple of ways of doing this. I tend to like to make a secondary template rather than just tracing the pick guard right out on top of the surface. In this case because I want to project a, a portion that's missing too, it just helps. So I've drawn a major outline here and then I can go ahead and fill in the gap here with the proper diameter for the rosette. You can also use this as a French curve and fill in the missing part. like so. It helps to put a brand new blade in your knife. Don't drink any coffee. Just go slow and focus. I'm putting some masking tape on the show surface of the pick guard. And then I'm going to super glue the template on there. Just a couple little drops here and there to hold it in position. Then I'm just holding the knife upright right up against the side of the template and uh, the first cut is a fairly light one. It acts more like a scoring cut and subsequent ones tend to follow that cut very closely. So you have to be careful with the first one, put a little more power into subsequent cuts, uh, but it really will take four or five tries to get through this half millimeter. There are people who use scissors for this, but I've never been able to get a really smooth curve cutting with scissors in this plastic. The knife usually throws up a little bit of a burr on the top surface, which I'll scrape away. And then I'm going to use a brown marker to color the white plastic uh, just on the edge there. Otherwise, it, you can see it and it's very annoying. So that'll work. It'll function. But I still feel a little bit weird about that, so I'm going to try an experiment. I'm going to see whether I can take this thick material. This is that 2 millimeter thick plastic and um, see if it's possible to thin this down. Maybe by half or so through sanding. Uh, this is an off cut, so I don't feel bad about it. The, um, the grain in this case is kind of running up and down, which might not be usual for a pick guard, but it's big enough that I could orient you know, at an angle like this, and we'll get something that might be like a, a fire stripe effect, which could be pretty nice. The other thing is like the darkness, the opacity you see here is really a function of the thickness of the material. You're just seeing more dye in there. So when I thin it down, this will probably lighten up in color. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I'm going to tape and glue this to a flat board just to make sure that there's something to back it up and keep it nice and flat when it's going through the sander. Did you ever have one of those instances where you got about two inches into something like this and you realized all of a sudden that the vacuum hose had fallen off the back of your sander but you really didn't want to stop and put it back on because you know something bad would happen if you did? It was one of those. Obviously with this plastic, heat is the real enemy. Um, I'm using a very aggressive paper sleeve there on the drum 
and uh, you know I'm feeding it as fast as it will let me but at the same time I'm doing a really light cut and trying not to force it because like I said we just want to do this as cool as we can I'm using a flat cabinet scraper to try to get rid of some of the striations and the washboarding effect from the sanding I'll also use a sanding block and try to get it really flat Okay, that ended up just over 50 thousandths, which is fine by me. It's a little thicker than the original, but it's okay. I didn't want to go too thin my first try. I've sanded it to shape, the outline, using uh, my oscillating spindle sander and a disc sander. And that leaves the edges a little bit rough. And the other thing you have to do for these thicker pick guards, these are this is akin to something you would find on a 1930s Martin, for instance. Um, you have to bevel the edges. And to do that, I'm going to use a razor blade. This can take some time. If you want to do a neat job, you want the bevel to be consistent all the way around. Soften the transition from the board onto the pick guard. It's good to look at old guards. Martin guards from the 30s and 40s have well, their material is just about this thick, but uh, they have wider bevels. Gibson guards from the uh, 60s tend to have narrower ones. So, I mean, there's sort of aesthetic preference here. Yeah, there's a real qualitative difference between the printed plastic stuff and the real deal. I'm going to use double-sided tape to hold the guard on. I've used tape, I've used spray adhesive, and I've even used contact cement. They all work. Tape might not be the strongest bond, but it's certainly strong enough. Once this is firmly stuck in place, I'll go ahead and put a little bit of wear on this to take the newness off of it. Um, you have to be kind of judicious with this. I'm using uh, micro mesh in 2400, 36, and 6000 grit. Sometimes it's a case of putting some heavier scratches on and then going back with a finer pad and actually buffing them out again. Um, sort of paying attention to where wear actually happens on a pick guard. So you'll have some areas that have more than others. Okay, I think I'm ready to call this one done at long last. I know someone in the comments is going to come and ask how much it would cost to do this amount of work. So let's see, we've got the neck reset, the full fret job, making the bridge, making a new nut and saddle, installing the new tuners, installing the pickup, adding those reinforcement braces, a crack repair on the back, some finish touch up on that, making the new pick guard, and then the setup. So that's definitely more than a thousand bucks worth of work. Is it worth it? Depends on your perspective. Um, this was a teaching and learning experience. I'm not doing it for profit. Would I go out and try and sell this for $1,200? No, I'm not that foolish. I mean, it wasn't my intention. Should you go and try and find a professional luthier to hot rod your harmony? I don't know. I can't answer that for you. In my mind, there's a balance that has to be struck so that it's affordable and everyone gets what they want out of the transaction. And I'll say, some of the converted harmonies I've seen really do show some shortcuts in workmanship that could be chalked up to either inexperience or maybe it's just someone trying to get a fair payday for their labor. Um, maybe this is something best left to the serious hobbyist. Someone who can devote a lot of hours and isn't concerned about having to get paid. So if you can find one of those guys, yeah, go for it. I've had questions about the pickup, the Ascendus, uh, the copy of the LR bags. Do I like it? Meh, it functions. Um, it sounds as good as any other $50 pickup you're liable to find. The preamp is actually very powerful. It's super loud. In this guitar, it's kind of prone to feedback. I mean, this is a very responsive guitar. Like, even just talking, the top is resonating here. Um, you know, the balance is all right in that. The tone is, you know, acceptable. But, you know, for the amount of work it takes to install one of those, you might as well just save up and buy something better. You know, I like the K&K &K Pure Series. I've mentioned that before. I also like the Shatton Design Transducer pickups. And really, for the money, some of the sound hole pickups you can buy these days, they actually sound really good. And if you decide to sell the guitar, it turns out you don't like it or something, you can always take them out and then move them around to the next one, right? So I'll plug in for a minute, and then I'll let you hear it unamplified. <laughs> 